In the world of tool making, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. A few months ago, I went through a fair bit of trouble to make this universal fixture plate. It was a bear of a project plagued with multiple setbacks, but I got it done nonetheless. And believe it or not, I've never actually used it. Quite silly, I know. The more I think about why it's gone untouched, the more I realize it's because I never fully completed the vision in my head. Originally, I had plans of making a full complement of different clamping elements to go with this plate. And while I did make a few, they never seemed to suit my needs. But now I have a new project on the horizon, one that will also need some clamps. So this is a perfect time to tie up a loose end and finally make a set of hold down clamps. I know what you might be thinking. Why am I making a set of clamps instead of buying something commercially or just making do with the ones I already have? The short answer, because that's no fun. But also, it's because I see room for improvement in both function and aesthetics, both of which play no small part in the enjoyment I get from my machining adventures. So I'm gonna design these exactly how I want. Here's what I'm thinking. I'll be going with the common bar, strap, finger, clamp design. Whatever you call it, it's a slotted steel bar with a chamfered tip. A pair of thumb screws will apply the clamping pressure, a pivot screw through the slot that will thread into the fixture plate underneath, then a jack screw through a threaded hole for applying the clamping load. I don't want the screws to bite into either the fixture plate or the bar clamp, so I'll add a pivoting brass foot to the jack screw, then a pivoting brass washer under the pivot screw. These joints will also give a little angular flexibility for the setups. Lastly, I want the tip to be non-marring to whatever part I might hold with it, so I'll include a soft brass insert of sorts on the tip. I'm actually pretty excited to get to work on these clamps, but this is far from a polished design, so first I'm going to need a little seat time at the old drafting table. All right, with those details sorted out, I feel a lot more confident in what I'm actually gonna make here. So let's get to work. I designed the main clamping bars around these offcuts of 4140 that were gifted to me, so I'll begin here. They're pretty close to the final shape I need, but are a bit too long. So first to pass through the shortening machine, then it's over to the mill to clean and square up all the faces, which I would do with this fly cutter if it wasn't broken. Last time I used it, I got a little heavy handed with one of the screws and well, the insert clamp is no more. Just goes to show, you can ignore a side project, but it won't ignore you. I'm just gonna go for a like-for-like -like design of the original, which looks a bit busy, but I think I can accomplish most of these features with just a couple setups. Plus, I happen to have the perfect material for the job. And while I'm here, I might as well make two, one for my other fly cutter as well. With both blanks mounted, I can square up five of the six sides simultaneously, starting with the top, then the backs, the fronts, then cut the sides down the width. The two holes in each are also accessible from this angle, so I'll knock these out as well. And tap the center hole for the clamping screw. One last cut with an end mill for the clearance slot in the middle. Then I can free each of these clamps from the material with a slitting saw blade. But these aren't quite ready for action just yet. The insert clamping side of the clamp actually has an angle to it. 
and it comes out to about a 5 thou difference across the face. This may seem insignificant, but I think it's actually a key part of the original design that I shouldn't omit. So it's back to the vise where I can tram that slanted face in until it's a 5 thou difference across the width. Then bring the end mill in for the final cut. Now you might be thinking these clamps are perfectly functional and ready to go, but you would be wrong. They're still missing the most important feature of all. Okay, now they're finished. And honestly, making these little clamps was basically a warm up for the big clamps I came here to make in the first place. So let's get this fly cutter mounted and get back to work on those. Unfortunately, I won't be able to square up all the sides in one setup like before, so I'll have to make do the normal way by milling one face at a time. This is always such a tedious and unexciting part of the process, but spending the time now to get all these bars the same dimensions will pay dividends to some of the operations to come. Okay, now on to something a little more exciting. Cutting the holes and slots in the bars. I'll start of course by spot drilling the four hole locations and scribing the rounded end I'll form later. Then move on to drilling the holes. I rimmed one in the tip for the brass insert, an undersized pilot hole for each end of the slot, then a tapped hole in the end for the jack screw. Now normally I would switch to an end mill to cut the slot at this point, but as you can see I would have to not only make a tool change, but also raise and lower the table almost a foot between each part. And ain't nobody got time for that. Instead, I'll take advantage of the vice stop and move on to drilling the rest of the bars first. I also had a slight change in heart after seeing how long the first two bars came out, and decided to make two of them an inch shorter. With all the drilling taken care of, I can make the tool change, then send the table on its long journey upward. This is a lot more rigid of a setup, so now I can simply plunge the slot mill through one of the pilot holes and send it on its way. nice. The rest of the slots are the same story, though they do have a distinct lack of chamfers. So I'll finish these out with a pass under the countersinking bit on each side. Having made all these bars the same starting dimensions makes swapping and flipping the parts like this a breeze. No need to re-reference the edges with each change, which is a huge time saver. These are coming along nicely. Before I can proceed though, I do want to go ahead and add the non-marring brass inserts to the tips. So it's time for some sweet sweet brass turning action. I want to use this carbide cutter with a sharp nose radius for this job as well as a lot of the parts to come. I'll need to get it mounted though, and set its height on center line, which is usually a bit of a hassle, but it just so happens that my last project was a tool to make this exact job a heck of a lot easier. I can simply place the cutting tip under the indicator's plunger and literally dial in the height until it reads zero. And just like that, I'm ready to go. These brass inserts are nothing too exciting, just a small stem turned to about a one thou press fit in the hole I added to the clamping bars, before filing the tip slightly and parting it off. But while I repeated this process, I did get a great amount of joy from the massive depth of cut this brass tolerated. It doesn't get more juicy than that. After rechucking by the stem, I'll file a gradual radius on the exposed face. Repeat that three more times and these are ready for assembly. These inserts overhang the edges a bit, but I'm hoping this will actually look good once I do the finishing cuts on the tip. Actually, it's time to work on those right now. I could go through the process of setting these up in the vise one by one, but as we already established, I don't fancy repetitive time-consuming tasks. If only I had a universal tilting fixture plate to hold all these parts at the same angle all at once. Oh wait, I do. With this, I should be able to mount all four bars and then clamp the pivot in the vise at the needed angle and cut them all at once. The only tricky part about it will be getting all the bars mounted. So let's see what I can come up with. Every other hole is meant for a dowel pin, so I can insert a few of these here, then use them to locate the bars by their slots. A couple of parallel bars underneath give clearance for the brass pads on the ends, then the shorter bars go on as well. To hold everything down, I have this bar I made from an old project that perfectly spans all four parts. And just to make sure nothing moves, a whole bunch of screws. But I can't tighten them yet. 
Because the center bars have two dowels, they are held straight. The end bars only have one though, and can still move. So to align them, I can simply press a parallel bar against the ends of all four to square them up before tightening down the clamp. One last quick thing to do before moving over to the mill is to mark the stopping point of the chamfers. This is a completely arbitrary distance, so scribe line accuracy is more than acceptable. Now to set this up in the mill. The angle in my design worked out to about 18.4 degrees. So I'll set the complement of this angle on a dial protractor, then using a square to hold the protractor straight, tap the fixture plate into position, which is apparent once the light between the two disappears. Now, after all that set up, I can finally start on these chamfers. I'm reasonably impressed with how stable this fixture plate is. This is, after all, the first time I've ever actually used it. These first facets turned out great. Now to set up for the ones on the sides. For these, I'll screw the bars together in pairs. And to locate the pairs on the plate, I'll use three dowels like so. Then bring the strap clamp in like before to hold everything down. The angle this time is a bit shallower at 13.1 degrees, so I'll tap it into this position, then send the fly cutter on its way. And in this case, rather than scribe my stopping point, I'm just going to go until I intersect the first set of chamfers. Cutting the other sides is the same process, but rather than break down the whole setup, I can leave it right here in the mill and just flip the clamp pairs over on the plate. That's the clamps nearly finished. Just a few more operations. A quick pass in the mill to cut away the remaining brass on the tip. A trip to the bandsaw to cut away the excess material on the two shortened bars. Grinding the rounds on the ends. Then of course some hand finishing to bring it all together. I've got to say, I'm pretty pleased with how these turned out. I made a few on the fly changes and I think they look even better for it but they aren't going to be very useful without the complement of screws and knobs that make them work. So time for a whole lot more of that sweet brass lathe work. I'll start with the jack screw feet. These will be what protects the fixture plate surface from nicks and dings. The start is pretty simple, just bringing down the diameter, before also cutting a reduced area, bringing the material to a neck. And of course, dropping a couple informal chamfers on here with a file. Now the inside of this foot pad has a spherical bottom that will allow it to pivot. So to form this feature, I'll keep it simple and just use a ball end mill. I'll also drop a clearance chamfer in the end, then it's over to the mill for a quick slitting operation. I'll get this chucked up in a collet block, then use the saw to cut two shallow slots. These leave a small tab on each side that I'll bend in later to hold onto the ball end of the screws. Back on the lathe I can part this off, then face and chamfer the bottom side. Three more of those and that takes care of the bottom half of the jack screws. Now to tackle the knobs that will go on the other ends. The stock for these is larger than my biggest collet though, so I'll have to switch to the three jaw chuck. And since the OD is already at diameter, I can move right on to some knurling. For these I'm going with a diamond knurl since I think it will suit both the style and grippiness I want. After engaging the wheels and checking that I'm not forming too deep, I'll send the power feed on its way across enough of the bar to cut four knobs from. Yep, that's adequately grippy. From here, I can work my way through the knobs, cutting the necks with the radius tool, chamfering the edges, and parting them off. These knobs may look ready to go, but I still have a lot more in store for them. For starters, I need to prepare them to be mounted to their screws. So it's back to the collet chuck to face and chamfer the ends. Then I can begin drilling, tapping, and reaming a counterbore in preparation for the screws. Still even more to go for these knobs, but they'll have to take a back seat for a moment while I prepare everything else. Up next are the pivot washers. These are easily the most straightforward parts, so this should be quick. I'll turn down enough stock to form the four washers, then drill a 3 8 clearance hole through the middle. I need to add a spherical feature to these washers, so just like the foot pads, I'll be using another ball end mill. Only I just discovered a small problem. This 3 quarter end mill is a smidge too large for my drill chuck. So much for this being a quick part. But, as is the case with so many hurdles I run into in the shop, if I look hard enough, my grandfather had just the tool I need. In this case, a much larger drill chuck. 
This is one I've yet to get to though, so pardon me while I get this a little more camera ready. Occasional side projects like this are an unfortunate reality of an entire shop going mostly unused for close to a decade. But it's all part of the process of bringing these tools back to life and becoming familiar with them myself. And honestly, it's just been neat discovering the tools my grandfather had, wondering where he might have used them before, or if he's run into the same obstacles I'm facing now. Because I can't even count the number of times a simple cleanup side project like this has saved me. Fortunately, this one was all just surface rust, and the internal still seems smooth as butter. So this thing is ready to mount. I'll get a Morse taper adapter on here, mount this in the tailstock, then get the ball end mill chucked up, and we're ready to go. The depth of this feature isn't very critical, so I'm taking it just shy of intersecting with the outside diameter, leaving just enough room for a light chamfer on the edge. I'll start the parting cut, but before going all the way through, chamfer the back edge as well, then finish parting it off and repeat for the remaining three pivot washers. The washers by themselves are no good, so next I have to make the pivot knobs. First turning down the outside diameter and cutting a step on one end, then adding a matching diamond knurl to these as well. And now for something a little different. This free end needs to have a spherical feature turned on to it to mate with the washers I just made. A ball turner would be the perfect tool for this job, but I'm afraid that's a bit more of a side project than I'm willing to take on for this job in particular. A side project I can manage though is a simple form tool. After scribing the radius on a piece of high speed steel and cutting away the bulk of the material with an angle grinder, I could begin the finer finishing work on the grinding wheel. Being that this is a free handed cut, there's only a certain level of precision I can expect to achieve here. But using the radius gauge as a guide, I can get something pretty close. Or at least close enough that the softness in the brass parts will make up the difference. Last is the grinder rake angle on the tool to give it a nice cutting edge that will help form a good chip. Not an easy task given the curved geometry, but I managed something I think will work. I'll get this mounted in the holder, set the height with an indicator, and we can give this a shot. Okay, now that's very satisfying. The chips just roll off of the tool like butter. I don't really have any references to go by for this cut though, so I'll have to use one of the pivot washers as a guide. Here you can see there's still a gap on the inside, indicating I need to bring the cutter in along the x-axis a bit more. But if I go any further, I'll be cutting into my knurling, and that's no good. So it's back to the grinding wheel for a quick relief cut before picking up where I left off. Okay, now you can see the gap has disappeared, and I have a perfect fit with the washer. I'll go ahead and zero the x-axis on the DRO to save myself some work later, then quickly work my way through the remaining knobs, parting them off as I go. Though I do want to take a moment to enjoy this beautiful cutter one last time. That marks the last of the brass parts, and this is all the material I have left. I literally couldn't have cut it any closer. The step I cut on the pivot side gives me the perfect spot to grip on for these next operations. So I'll face and chamfer this end, as well as drill, tap, and ream a counterboard hole like on the big knobs. Before I can finish these brass pieces up though, I need to shift gears a bit and make some modifications to the screws. First I'll need a way to hold them in the lathe. So I'll face the end of a steel off cut, then drill and tap a mounting hole. This lets me perfectly center a screw in the lathe, which will also help me with most of the remaining operations on this project. First is to turn down the screw heads to match the reamed counterboards in the knobs. After taking the time to dial in on the diameter of the first screw though, I can simply zero the DRO and quickly work my way through the rest of the screws making them match. That's eight screws for the eight knobs, but four of them still get a ball feature turned on their ends to match the brass foot pads. So it's back to the grinder one last time to make another form tool for the job. The screws are mounted from the back side of the block this time, and are held in place with a jam nut and washer. I'll square up and turn down the end of the screw, then bring in the form tool to round the end to a perfect fit with the foot pad. Three more of those, and all the screws are complete and ready for assembly with their respective knobs. The ball ended screws go with the big knobs, and a dab of Loctite on the threads and screw head hold them in place. The small knobs get the same treatment, 
And with all these together, I can finish out the machining. Threaded back into the lathe, the big knobs get a final facing with a nice decorative hollow. Then on the little knobs, just a facing operation to bring the screw heads flush. Now these knobs would probably work just fine for what I need them for, but there's still one more thing I want to add. The scallops on the outside. You know, to be fancy. I'll need the mill for this, and to help speed up the process, I'll make a very quick and simple fixture. After first skimming a scrap block of aluminum with the fly cutter, I'll drill and tap a mounting hole and zero the DRO at this spot. Now as I thread the knobs in place, I already know where their center is without having to find it over and over again as I work through all of them. Just to make sure nothing moves, I'll also lock a jam nut on the bottom. And with everything secure, I can work through each of the scallops in sequence with a slot mill as I go to the coordinate centers of each cut. And if you thought these were going to make it out of here without chamfers on each, think again. Scallops are nice, but chamfered scallops are really nice. I've been looking forward to this exact operation since I started this build, because man, this is some of the most glorious chamfering work I think I've ever achieved. No doubt I'll be making an excuse to use this technique again. The pivot screw knobs go much the same, only this time a four scallop pattern. And of course chamfers on these as well. Now, all the bars, knobs, screws, washers, and feet are ready to go. There is of course just one small assembly item left, and that's to attach the feet to the jack screws. I left a couple of swaging tabs on these to bend in on the ball ends of the screws. So I'll crimp these in slightly with the jaws of the vise so that they're free to pivot around, but still stay attached. Alright, we're done. Let's see if all this hard work is going to pay off. Oh yeah, these are really nice. Looks like it was a good call to make two of these clamps shorter, because they are perfect for holding something near the edge of the plate. And the longer bars are great for when I need extra reach, or just a lot more clamping leverage. And as far as tightness goes, they seem to hold really well. The knurled and scalloped knobs are super grippy, making tightening pretty easy. And if there ever is a case I do need some extra leverage, I can just use an Allen wrench to really gronk down on the clamps. I was also a bit skeptical at how long I left the screws, but this ended up working out well. I can comfortably clamp parts ranging in thickness from about an inch and a quarter all the way down to a quarter inch. And the ball joints I put on the pivot and jack screws give me just enough wiggle room for when things aren't dead level. To top it all off, the brass components are soft enough that they don't really damage the material or the clamp itself. Which is important because the cherry on top of this whole project is how nice these turned out. It's one thing to be pleased with the design on paper, but it's a whole other thing once it's actually taken shape with the different material colors and textures. I'm definitely going to have to get over that initial anxiety of putting these to use for the first time. They're just so nice, I don't want to mess them up. But I did make them for a reason, and it wasn't just to make it more likely that I would use my fancy fixture plate. No, no, I have a whole new project in mind that I think will see a great amount of use. And these clamps are only the first step in that direction. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.